Section 21 of Scott's Last Expedition, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hollis Hanover. Scott's Last Expedition, Volume 1. The Journals of Robert Falcon Scott. Arranged by Leonard Huxley. Second part of Chapter 10. In Winter Quarters modern style monday may twenty two wilson bowers atkinson evans p o clissold and self went to see royds with a go-cart carrying our sleeping bags a cooker and a small quantity of provision the go-cart consists of a framework of steel tubing supported on four bicycle wheels the surface of the floes carries one to two inches of snow, barely covering the salt ice flowers, and for this condition this vehicle of days is excellent. The advantage is that it meets the case where the salt crystals form a heavy frictional surface for wood runners. I am inclined to think that there are great numbers of cases when wheels would be more efficient than runners on the sea ice. We reached Cape Royds in two and one half hours, killing an emperor penguin in the bay beyond Sea Barn. And this bird was in splendid plumage, the breast reflecting the dim northern light like a mirror. It was fairly dark when we stumbled over the rocks and dropped on to Shackleton's hut. Clissold started the cooking range. Wilson and I walked over to the black beach and round back by Blue Lake. The temperature was down at minus 31 degrees, and the interior of the hut was very cold. Tuesday, May 23. We spent the morning mustering the stores within and without the hut, after a cold night which we passed very comfortably in our bags. We found a good quantity of flour and Danish butter, and a fair amount of paraffin with smaller supplies of assorted articles the whole sufficient to afford provision for such a party as ours for about six or eight months if well administered in case of necessity this would undoubtedly be very useful reserve to fall back upon these stores are somewhat scattered and the hut has a dilapidated comfortless appearance due to its tenantless condition but even so it seemed to be much less inviting than our old discovery hut at sea armitage after a cup of cocoa there was nothing to detain us and we started back the only useful articles added to our weights being a scrap or two of leather and five hymn books hitherto we have been only able to muster seven copies this increase will improve our sunday services wednesday may twenty four a quiet day with northerly wind the temperature rose gradually to zero Having the night duty did not go out. The moon has gone, and there is little to attract one out of doors. Atkinson gave us an interesting little discourse on parasitology, with a brief account of the life history of some ecto- and some endo-parasites, nematodes, trematodes. He pointed out how that in nearly every case there was a secondary host, how in some cases disease was caused, and in others the presence of the parasite was even helpful. He acknowledged the small progress that has been made in the study. He mentioned ankylostomiasis, blood-sucking worms, bilartsia, trematode, attacking bladder, Egypt, filaria, round tapeworm, guinea worm, trichina, pork, and others pointing to diseases caused. From worms he went to protozoa, trypanosomes, sleeping sickness, host tsetse fly, showed life history comparatively, propagated in secondary host or insisting in primary host, similarly malarial germs spread by Anopheles mosquitoes, all very interesting. In the discussion following, Wilson gave some account of the grouse disease worm, and especially of the interest in finding free-living species almost identical, also part of the life of disease worm is free-living. Here we approached a point pressed by Nelson concerning the degeneration consequent on adoption of the parasitic habit. All parasites seem to have descended from free-living beasts. One asks, 
what is degeneration without receiving a very satisfactory answer after all such terms must be empirical thursday may twenty five it has been blowing from south with heavy gusts and snow temperature extraordinarily high minus six degrees this has been a heavy gale the weather conditions are certainly very interesting simpson has again called attention to the wind in february march and april at cape evans the record shows an extraordinary large percentage of gales it is quite certain that we scarcely got a fraction of the wind on the barrier and doubtful if we got as much at hut point friday may twenty six a calm and clear day a nice change from recent weather it makes an enormous difference to the enjoyment of this life if one is able to get out and stretch one's legs every day this morning i went up the ramp no sign of open water so that my fears for a broken highway in the coming season are now at rest in future gales can only be a temporary annoyance anxiety as to their result is finally allayed this afternoon i searched out ski and ski sticks and went for a short run over the flow the surface is quite good since the recent snowfall and wind this is satisfactory as sledging can now be conducted on ordinary lines and if convenient our parties can pull on ski the young ice troubles of april and may have passed away it is curious that circumstances caused us to miss them altogether during our stay in the discovery we are living extraordinarily well at dinner last night we had some excellent thick seal soup very much like thick hare soup this was followed by an equally tasty seal steak and kidney pie and a fruit jelly the smell of frying greeted us on awakening this morning and at breakfast each of us had two of our nutty little notothenia fish after our bowl of porridge these little fish have an extraordinarily sweet taste bread and butter and marmalade finished the meal at the midday meal we had bread and butter cheese and cake and tonight i smell mutton in the preparation under the circumstances it would be difficult to conceive more appetizing repasts or a regime which is likely to produce scorbutic symptoms i cannot think we shall get scurvy nelson lectured us tonight giving a very able little elementary sketch of the objects of the biologist a fact struck one in his explanation of the rates of elimination two of the offspring of two parents alone survive speaking broadly this is the same of the human species or the ling with twenty four million eggs in the row of each female he talked much of evolution adaptation etc mendelism became the most debated point of the discussion the transmission of characters has a wonderful fascination for the human mind there was also a point striking deep in the debate on professor loeb's experiment with sea urchins how far had he succeeded in reproducing the species without the male spermatozoa not very far it seemed when all was said a theme for a pen would be the expansion of interest in polar affairs compare the interests of a winter spent by the old arctic voyagers with our own and look into the causes the aspect of everything changes as our knowledge expands the expansion of human interest in rude surroundings may perhaps best be illustrated by comparisons it will serve to recall such a simple case as the fact that our ancestors applied the terms horrid frightful to mountain crags which in our own day are more justly admired as loftily grand and beautiful the poetic conception of this natural phenomenon has followed not so much an inherent change of sentiment as the intimacy of wider knowledge and the death of superstitious influence one is much struck by the importance of realizing limits saturday may twenty seven a very unpleasant cold and windy day annoyed with the conditions so did not go out in the evening bowers gave his lecture on sledging diets he has shown great courage in undertaking the task great perseverance in unearthing facts from books and a considerable practical skill in stringing these together it is a thankless task to search polar literature for dietary facts and still more difficult to attach due weight to varying statements 
Some authors omit discussion of this important item altogether. Others fail to note alterations made in practice or additions afforded by circumstances. Others, again, forget to describe the nature of various foodstuffs. Our lecturer was both entertaining and instructive when he dealt with old-time rations, but he naturally grew weak in approaching the physiological aspect of the question. He went through with it manfully, and with a touch of humor much appreciated, whereas, for instance, he deduced facts from the equivalent of Mr. Jewell, a gentleman whose statements he had no reason to doubt. Wilson was the mainstay of the subsequent discussion, and put all doubtful matters in a clearer light. Increase your fats, carbohydrate, is what science seems to say, and practice with conservatism is inclined to step cautiously in response to this urgence. I shall, of course, go into the whole question as thoroughly as available information and experience permits. Meanwhile, it is useful to have had a discussion which aired the popular opinions. Feeling went deepest on the subject of tea versus cocoa. Admitting all that can be said concerning stimulation and reaction, I am inclined to see much in favor of tea. Why should not one be mildly stimulated during the marching hours if one can cope with reaction by profounder rest during the hours of inaction? Sunday, May 28. Quite an excitement last night. One of the ponies, the gray which I led last year and salved from the flow, either fell or tried to lie down in his stall, his head being lashed up to the stanchions on either side. In this condition he struggled and kicked till his body was twisted right round and his attitude extremely uncomfortable. Very luckily his struggles were heard almost at once, and his head ropes being cut, Oates got him on his feet again. He looked a good deal distressed at the time, but is now quite well again, and has been out for his usual exercise. Held service as usual. This afternoon went on ski around the bay and back across. Little or no wind, sky clear, temperature minus 25 degrees. It was wonderfully mild, considering the temperature. This sounds paradoxical, but the sensation of cold does not conform to the thermometer. It is obviously dependent on the wind, and less obviously on the humidity of the air and the ice crystals floating in it. I cannot very clearly account for this effect, but as a matter of fact, I have certainly felt colder in still air at minus 10 degrees than I did today when the thermometer was down to minus 25 degrees, other conditions apparently equal. The amazing circumstance is that by no means can we measure the humidity, or indeed the precipitation or evaporation. I have just been discussing with Simpson the insuperable difficulties that stand in the way of experiment in this direction, since cold air can only hold the smallest quantities of moisture, and saturation covers an extremely small range of temperature. Monday, May 29. Another beautiful calm day went out both before and after the midday meal. This morning with Wilson and Bowers toward the thermometer off Inaccessible Island. On my way, my companionable dog was heard barking and dimly seen. We went toward him and found that he was worrying a young seal leopard. This is the second found in the strait this season. We had to secure it as a specimen, but it was sad to have to kill. The long, lithe body of this seal makes it almost beautiful in comparison with our stout, bloated weddles. This poor beast turned swiftly from side to side as we strove to stun it with a blow on the nose. As it turned, it gaped its jaws wide, but oddly enough, not a sound came forth, not even a hiss. After lunch, a sledge was taken out to secure the prize, which had been photographed by flashlight. Ponting has been making great advances in flashlight work and has opened up quite a new field in which artistic results can be obtained in the winter. Lecture Japan Tonight Ponting gave us a charming lecture on Japan with wonderful illustrations of his own. He is happiest in his descriptions of the artistic side of the people with which he is in fullest sympathy. So he took us to see the flower pageants, the joyful festivals of the cherry blossom, the wisteria, the iris and chrysanthemum, the somber colors of the beech blossom, and the paths about the lotus gardens, 
where mankind meditated in solemn mood. We had pictures, too, of Nico and its beauties, of temples and great Buddhas. Then, in more touristy strain of volcanoes and their craters, waterfalls and river gorges, tiny tree-clad islets that feature of Japan, baths and their bathers, Enos, and so on. His descriptions were well given, and we all of us thoroughly enjoyed our evening. Thursday, May 30. Am busy with my physiological investigations. Footnote, i.e., in relation to sledging ration. End of footnote. Atkinson reported a sea leopard at the tide crack. It proved to be a crab eater, young and very active. In curious contrast to the sea leopard of yesterday, in snapping around, it uttered considerable noise, a gaspingly throaty growl. Went out to the outer berg where there was quite a collection of people, mostly in connection with Ponting, who had brought camera and flashlight. It was beautifully calm and comparatively warm. It was good to hear the gay chatter and laughter and see ponies and their leaders come up out of the gloom to add liveliness to the scene. The sky was extraordinarily clear at noon and to the north very bright. We have had an exceptionally large tidal range during the last three days. It has upset the tide gauge arrangements and brought a little doubt on the method. Day is going into the question, which we thoroughly discussed today. Tidal measurements will be worse than useless unless we can be sure of the accuracy of our methods. Pools of salt water have formed over the beach flows in consequence of the high tide, and in the chase of the crab eater, today very brilliant flashes of phosphorescent light appeared in these pools. We think it due to a small cape pod. I have just found a reference to the same phenomena in Nordenskid's Vega. He, and apparently Bellow before him, noted the phenomenon, an interesting instance of bipolarity. Another interesting phenomenon observed today was a cirrus cloud lit by sunlight. It was seen by Wilson and Bowers, five degrees above the northern horizon. The sun is nine degrees below our horizon, and without refraction we calculated a cloud could be seen which was twelve miles high. Allowing refraction, the phenomenon appears very possible. Wednesday, May 31. The sky was overcast this morning and the temperature up to minus thirteen degrees. Went out after lunch to land's end. The surface of snow was sticky for ski except where drifts were deep. There was an oppressive feel in the air, and I got very hot, coming in with head and hands bare. At five, from dead calm, the wind suddenly sprang up from the south, forced forty miles per hour, and since that it has been blowing a blizzard. Wind very gusty from twenty to sixty miles. I have never known a storm come on so suddenly, and it shows what possibility there is of individuals becoming lost even if they go only a short way from the hut. Tonight, Wilson has given us a very interesting lecture on sketching. He started by explaining his methods of rough sketch and written color record, and explained its suitability to this climate as opposed to colored chalks, etc. A very practical method for cold fingers, and one that becomes more accurate with practice and observation. His theme then became the extreme importance of accuracy, his mode of expression and explanation frankly Ruskinesque. Don't put in meaningless lines. Every line should be from observation. So with contrast of light and shade, fine shading, subtle distinction, everything, impossible without care, patience, and trained attention. He raised a smile by generalizing failures and sketches of others of our party which had been brought to him for criticism. He pointed out how much had been put in from preconceived notion. He will draw a berg faithfully as it is now and as he studies it, but he leaves sea and sky to be put in afterwards, as he thinks they must be like sea and sky everywhere else, and he is content to try and remember how these should be done. Nature's harmonies cannot be guessed at. He quoted much from Ruskin, leading on a little deeper to composition, paying a hearty tribute to Ponting. The lecture was delivered in the author's usual modest strain, but unconsciously it was expressive of himself and his wholehearted thoroughness. 
He stands very high in the scale of human beings. How high I scarcely knew till the experience of the past few months. There is no member of our party so universally esteemed. Only tonight I realize how patiently and consistently he has given time and attention to help the efforts of the other sketchers. And so it is all through. He has had a hand in almost every lecture given and has been consulted in almost every effort which has been made toward the solution of the practical or theoretical problems of our polar world. The achievement of a great result by patient work is the best possible object lesson for struggling humanity, for the results of genius, however admirable, can rarely be instructive. The chief of the scientific staff sets an example which is more potent than any other factor in maintaining that bond of good fellowship which is the marked and beneficent characteristic of our community. End of chapter 10 Recording by Hollis Hanover